Washington Mullets. At forward number 43, 6'11 from Iona, Jeff Rulin. At center number 44, 6'10 from Hampton Institute, Rick Mahorn. Hey, it's Adam here. This is the debut episode of a new series featuring the legendary Beef Brothers, Rick Mahorn and Jeff Ruland. Our goal is to regularly release episodes of 45 minutes or less. Rick and Jeff share their opinions on today's NBA before we go back in time to explore the wonders of NBA history. The Washington Bullets Beef Brothers were arguably the NBA's most fearsome duo from 1982 through 1985. They teamed with Greg Ballard, rest in peace, to form an imposing front line. Select episodes may feature special guests, Bullets era teammates, or adversaries from the halcyon days of Rick's and Jeff's careers. The audio is delivered here in podcast form, but you can watch our conversations online. Full episodes will live on my YouTube channel, whilst an old school only edit will appear on the Beef Brothers channel. Yes, that's right. Rick and Jeff are on YouTube. Relevant links are in the show notes of your listening app and also appear beneath the video. We encourage your interaction. Help steer the show. Ask questions or add comments on YouTube and the Beef Brothers will respond in future episodes. If you prefer email, reach out to Rick and Jeff by contacting me in all airness at gmail.com. Rick and Jeff are terrific guys very funny, and offer up some great conversation. A quick warning that occasional language during this series is not safe for young ears. Now, let's meet, M-E-A-T, the Beef Brothers. Let's say good day to the duo collectively known as the iconic Beef Brothers. We've got 1989 NBA champion and 18-year veteran Rick Mahorn and 1982 all-rookie first-teamer and a two-time NBA All-Star, Jeff Ruland. How are you this evening, gentlemen? Great to be here. I'm glad to be here, but you could have left Jeff out of this doggone show. <laughs> <laughs> he insisted on being yeah, here. See what a big boy you are on this, this video. You oh, realize. shut up. Just <laughs> shut up. <laughs> All right, guys. My name is Adam. If my accent didn't already give it away, I live in Australia. I've followed the NBA since 1989 when I was... 13 years old. I host an NBA podcast called In All Airness. It's devoted to the history of basketball, particularly the 1980s and 1990s, but we'll get into all kinds of topics. Just for the benefit of our viewers and listeners today, episodes will begin with a discussion of today's NBA. We'll cover some of the latest news and hear Rick's and Jeff's opinions, and then we'll turn back the clock as they reminisce about some of their experiences and life in basketball back in their playing days. I hope to ask them today about the first time they met We'll examine the origins of their nicknames, and if we have time at the end, I might even give them a quick quiz on some Australian slang, see how they go with knowing which words or phrases I'm talking about. The season commenced on October 18. As we record this, it's the evening of the 24th of October in the US, and there's eight games on the schedule tonight. Four teams are undefeated. We've got Milwaukee that are 2-0, and and then we have Boston, Utah, and Portland, who are each 3-0. and I'll throw it out to both of you. Which teams have impressed the most in the opening week of the season? Refer to Mr. Mahorn, since he's the NBA analyst. For oh, well, not surprising that Boston has gotten off to such a great lead. They got some unfinished business to do. They were looking to, to try to win a championship. And even though they had the Emi Adoka situation, they still focused in on what's going on. What they need to do, they went on the road, one down in Orlando, really huge game. And I'll tell you, they're just playing lights out basketball right now. But the surprising team to me is the Utah Jazz. I mean, they got rid of everybody. Danny Ainge went wholesale. And all of a sudden, it's like, Utah's 3-0? and I thought they were tanking. And that's when you start looking around, Jeff and Adam, you're going like, are they tanking? Because Portland... Portland being undefeated doesn't, yeah, no Dame Lillard last year, but now that you come back, he's fully healthy, and the pieces, the additions that they have, and Jeremy Grant signing, extending him, that team is competing. It's all about competing to me. I look around the league, it's a lot of parity, but what's my disappointing team is that hat that you got on there, Adam. Them Sixers, ooh, they they smell like some poo. poo. <laughs> 
They haven't had a great start. They're off to 0-3, one of the winless teams in the league. Jeff, what are your thoughts on the opening week of the season there and which teams have stood out most to you? He hit it right on the head with Utah. I'm flabbergasted. I, I'm looking forward to seeing them play now. They're coming out. They don't care. I like the Hornets. I like the Bulls if they could ever get all the pieces healthy. I mean, there's someone to watch tonight. A big fan of Cleveland, believe it or not, even though it's a bicker staff. <laughs> Coach for uh, Bullets back in the day with us. What's funny with that, when you said that, the connections that we have with Wes Unsell Jr. and also Bickerstaff in Cleveland, father coached us, and then Wes Unsell's like my dad. So basically, my little brother's coaching the Washington Wizards, which I'm excited for. They started out, lost to Cleveland. To me, that's kind of like the sibling game. You see two two guys that grew up around the Bullets and and you go, okay, Bernie Bickerstaff, and you got Wes Unsell. Both guys has been around the league so long. But, you know, it's fun when you see the, the namesakes keep going. That's just exciting because we get ready to play the Wizards tomorrow night. So I'm looking forward to it. For me, Kuz got to be the key. He's got to be more consistent. They win a couple games. He plays well. They lose a game. He doesn't play well. The, the big kid off the bench. Got to be in the starting yeah, line. Right. Yeah, at some point. Kid from Japan. I don't want to mutilate his name. <laughs> <laughs> the winless teams thus far. We mentioned the Sixers, who I'm rocking their hat, which is to the displeasure of both of you. Now, it's, it's not that it's disappointing. But then again, it, it is disappointing because you have a, a former MVP. You have Joel Embiid, who is always talking like they cheated him from last year being MVP. My thing is when I look at Philadelphia and 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 also LA, when you when you look at those two teams, they got all the star power. Sometimes you don't need to have star power in order to be a good team. I.e., example is the Utah Jazz. It ain't like they got Donovan Mitchell there, Rudy Gobert anymore, and Boyan Bondanovich, but they they just got guys that like the hoop. And that's what to me, sometimes I think the NBA is missing because when you look at it, Right now, these young men, they come in 18, 19 years old, and it's impressing to them to get the money, they get the bag, and then it's like, okay, I got the bag. What else do you want to do? So I know we'll get in further with that, but when I look at the disappointing with the Lakers and, and also the Sixers, it's like you got LeBron James, and, and shoot, I'm not even thinking Brooklyn is all that hot either. You know, they got all these guys, but then you got Milwaukee and you got these guys that's coming in with some bad attitudes, and they're ready to win some games. Sixers need a bench. The kid from Utah, I think, is going to be an all-star. You know who I'm talking about? He had a great world championship. Starts with an M, Marcus. Why do you say that? Why are you right next door to me anyway, since you're telling everybody you're in Australia? You're right next door to me. So you look at it. But, Jeff, sometimes when I'm looking at these games and watch the game the other night, the Pistons and the Pacers game, you get two teams that are very young. And when I look at the young teams, you go, okay, it's going to be a lot of competitiveness. But then you go down to Orlando. I saw, um, Hello? I saw Paolo. Man, Paolo reminds me of Grant Hill, supersized. He can handle the ball. And listen, I, I was like, whoa. But then I'm watching the Pacers. And then one game, they had 15 blocks against the Pistons. And I'm like, you don't even have Miles Turner out there, but they blocking shots. They're having fun. They're running up and down the court. So having young guys on your team, you hope they develop quickly and respond. The kid I was talking about is the kid Markison. Markinen? Oh, oh. Corey Markinen. Yeah. Markinen. Yeah. Oh, Markinen. Well, come on. I don't want to disrespect anybody with my pronunciation. Long Island. Well, no, but Mark, I can barely get my horn out. Oh, but, I can barely get ruling out, but it's not a real name sometimes. Rule land. Anyway, I look at Laurie Marketing, and when he was with Cleveland, Cleveland had that giant size front line. It was him, Eric Mobley, and a Jared Allen. I was like, whoa, they, they're really big and long. But Marketing has always been a good player. He just couldn't stay healthy. And that's the big key for, for him. He's got to stay healthy. He's He can play, but it's just the fact that finding the right tie, he done been traded three times. When you look at most of the European players, a lot of them are fundamentally sound. 
And the reason why they're fundamentally sound, and I know people are going to say, oh, uh, no, and I played overseas, and Jeff, you played overseas. They have juniors. They got these kids. They're not playing AAU per se. They're scrimmaging against that team, and they play club basketball. Kobe Bryant, the late, great Kobe Bryant said, a lot of European players are fundamentally sound. Not well, athletic. That's, that's all what it is, really. It's, their, it's really their job after the sixth grade. It's really most of them get hired by clubs or their families are hired by clubs. I'm very proud of the fact that I went back and got my degree, but I'm still wondering what exactly it's going to do for me. But you know, you got to have that degree, Jeff, because sometimes you, you want to be in a situation. They'll say to you, well, you didn't finish college or you didn't get your degree. And then you go get your degree. Now, what the hell are they going to say? What the fuck are they going to say now? You got it. So apparently you don't want to give me the job. Mm. Yeah, been down the road too. Mm -hmm. Just to continue on the theme of the winless teams, there's also Orlando, uh, Oklahoma City, Sacramento, and Houston have all started 0 and 3. Trivia, name the four teams that don't have an S in their name. Utah Jazz. That's one. That don't have an S. Are you asking me? Orlando. Yeah, there you go. Good. Orlando Magic. What else you want, Rules? Oklahoma City Thunder. Oklahoma. Thunder, one more. It's Orlando. Heat. Oh, uh, Miami Heat. Wow, that was really difficult. Get it, did you? Well, hold on. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, when you say those teams are disappointing, the other teams that you mentioned in Sacramento and also you mentioned uh, OKC in Orlando, you look at those teams and you say, well, is Oklahoma still trying to find their groove because most of the time they're hurt or they're looking to tank and they're trying to get the guy, Victor, I don't know how to say his name, Wayama. They, they already got uh, Holgren, who's not going to play this year. You look at your team and say, we need to get back into winning. OKC ain't won since they traded Westbrook and all the players that they had at heart and Durant. Oh. You got three, three MVPs right there. That you go, why did they keep them? Well, well salary cap. Frederick from Sacramento, how about their playoff team? I think they stink. We're they talking Sacramento. Play. Yeah. They're like rah, 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 the same old, same old. It's new plan every year, kind of like yeah. the play DC. Every year is a new plan. <laughs> it's a narrative. They change it up. They give you these different words, and you say, oh, I'm going to fall for the fluff. But hey, it's 30 teams in this league. They have the salary caps, and they got these very lucrative television contracts. Like, like They're going to get paid regardless. I just don't see the excitement there. A quick question for you, Rick. You're the longtime analyst on the Pistons Radio Network, and you sit alongside uh, Mark Champion, play-by-play -play man. Detroit are one and two as we record this. What are your thoughts on the team's early season start and their fortunes as the season will progress? The thing is, you're going to go through growing pains. You have Jaden Ivey. You have new people. There's no familiar ball movement as of yet. It's a lot of bright spots. You have Kate Cunningham, the number one pick from last year, who you know you're looking for him to have a step out year. Then you got Isaiah Stewart in the middle and Sadiq Bay. So you have a very young starting lineup, and hopefully that they can learn on the fly. Like I said, it's going to be growing pains for the team, but they compete. What is it, Duran or Durant? What that kid? Yeah, Jalen Duran. He's been coming off the bench, almost averaging a double double rebound wise. Very physical, still young. He's only eighteen. That's the crazy thing about it. He's already built like built like a grown man, and you're just waiting for him to get a little better in increments. But see, that's the thing about. When you have a lot of young guys that play one year and they come into pros, mm -hmm. it's not like just a lot of experience. Yeah, a lot to learn. Have. Yeah, you still have a lot to learn. Now, unlike when we came in, it was uh, when I came in, shoot, it was only 22 teams and they just expanded the roster from 11 to 12. So I just had a chance to make the team myself. So you got to figure the competition was thick, but now with 30 teams, you're drafting potential and not drafting the guys after that. I look at the Memphis Grizzlies all the time. They had uh, Taron Jackson Jr. at third pick, and then they had John ja Moran at second pick. But all the other picks that they had, guys who were in college, 
for three years, four years. And then you all of a sudden you just see them have a breakout year because those guys been there in college, get the experience of learning fundamental basketball at a high pace. Have you noticed, which I'm a big fan of their whole team, about how well they play when that little dude isn't in there and then how good he is? I mean, it's crazy. Well, it's crazy because last year when he got hurt, and sometimes I look at it in football, when a star gets hurt, all of a sudden, how do you come back to get the team on the same page and still win? Look at the Dallas Cowboys, for example. They came with the backup quarterback, Cooper Rush. Yep. And next thing you know, they won three in a row. And then now to get Dak Prescott, their number one quarterback. But one thing that he learned from watching from the, from the sideline and also when you're sitting on the bench, you learn how you can help your other players get better. So that's why I know that you like the way Memphis plays. No question. I got a question for you, Jeff. When you see guys, take the night off, does that upset you in some way, shape, or form? Or do you feel for the fans that bought that ticket to see that certain player, but he ain't playing that night? Is that kind of messed up to you? I don't try to judge it in that way. I was one like yourself. Who As they say, low management. I play on um, broken ankles and shit like that. And now I'm healthy for the first time in 25 years. I wish people would have told me, Hey, maybe you shouldn't play today, but different it, time now. And it's a different era, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, you pay for a ticket, you deserve to see the best. So what Let's, say you on that, Adam? Being so far away in Australia, I know that there are Aussies that do go over to the, the States and actually go to maybe one or two games in their lifetime. And occasionally I do know of some people and acquaintances, friends online that have gone over to see LeBron play or to see Durant play and they're sitting out because of that load management term. And, and obviously, it's, you can't please everybody, but it does seem that some of these players do tend to take uh, extra days off. One more for you, Adam. When the Australian team came over here and won that game in the preseason, were you excited or what, what was going through your mind? That's a great question. Yeah, the Adelaide 36ers, when they upset the Phoenix Suns, there was a lot of publicity over here in Australia. Big news on most of the TV networks. We do have... 25 million people or so in Australia. They got lots of airtime. It was really surprising. I think they played the game of their lives almost, the Adelaide 36ers. They were hitting three-point shots left, right, and center, just dribbling over half court and just throwing them up. So it was pretty impressive. What did you guys make of it? I was right. embarrassed. That's what I was. We're supposed to have the best players in the world, but mm -hmm. some teams get lucky. They got lucky. In fact, they, they stepped in some dog poo. And all they did was come on the court and they shot the lights out. That's all it takes is to make one. It felt like to me when the United States lost the Olympic gold. That's what That's I was how it felt like. You know, Mac was on that team. What do you think about that? Not the McMillan one. Not not the uh, uh, loss what, against Russia. What I'm, what I'm asking you about. I was still young. I didn't care what, about that. You gotta have a thought about that though. No, I don't really. They never accept the, the silver medal or whatever. Well, no, what's your opinion on that? My opinion on it is just that a couple of referees needed some money or something. I don't know. They did their ass off. What they did. Yeah. They gave them so many chances. And at one time, you figure they're going to strike the bridge sooner or later. But my thing is, it felt like when, when the 36ers, right? Yeah, that's it. They, yeah, when they won, it felt like when... The Olympic team went over there and lost to Greece. It felt like, okay, we're supposed to have the best players in the world. But it just seems like it's going to be that one anomaly where this team's going to hit some threes. But also, you take teams lightly. When you take teams lightly in this league, saying, oh, you're looking at, oh, we just playing them, or we, play, we ain't going to prepare mentally, instead of taking them and choking them really quick and, and taking care of your business early. And you knew that, Jeff, when we played, it was like, you want to establish yourself. It ain't going to be no easy night. And you could be embarrassed. It's a big surprise. Obviously, it was only a preseason game, but it was big news here in Australia. But you're right, Rick. They were on fire, Adelaide, from the three-point range. And I don't think that'll probably ever happen again to that extent, for sure. Well, they're going to knock them on the ass next time. 
there'll be revenge <laughs> needing to be sought. <laughs> Just quickly before we start delving into your history, your playing days, guys, the league leaders through the 23rd of October, we've got Jason Tatum, who's leading the league at almost 35 points per game. Rudy Gobert, the newly acquired Minnesota Timberwolf, 18 rebounds per game. And Trey Young of Atlanta as leading the league in assists at almost 12 per game. Anything you'd like to add before we just quickly talk about some old school basketball? Well, you know, I'm looking at teams trying to jockey for position. Some teams come in with a goal. Some teams come in with a a semi-goal, but may hit luck. Is it where I look at Boston and I said a previous in the show, they're coming back with a vengeance. They want to get back to where they were and try to win that chip and keep the best record in the league. So you really have to go through them. I just look at the league. You don't want to bury yourself a hole like Philadelphia and also the Lakers because now you're fighting uphill every time you come on the court. Your mental edge is not there. But when you talk about guys leading the league and scoring, that fluctuates to me. But then you look at Rudy Gobert's doing what Rudy Gobert does. But then when I look at that, Ain't won a championship or get to the finals. He, it's the playoffs that count more so than the regular season. Jeff, anything you'd like to add before we go back in time and talk about your careers? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm looking forward to the season and how it develops. and going to be uh, a lot of different storylines. Based on my research before we chatted today, it's August of 1979, and you are both in Colorado Springs. And per some newspaper reports, I read that you were two of the 32 basketball players hoping to earn a spot on Team USA for the World University Games in Mexico City. I can see Rick smiling already. What do you recall of those tryouts, and was that actually the first time that you guys met? We met was- in practice. <laughs> I remember the hot tub drinking Coors Light with the U.S. volleyball team. His volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was the only small school there. I was the only... Hampton Institute. I wound up rooming with Cal for the whole month. Well, that's after they cut me because Bobby Knight looked at the roster and said, Hampton Institute, what the hell is that? I was rebounding my butt off in there. It was some Division Two guy that was the head coach. But I remember... Uh, Dan Anderson? Yes, yes. Training camp. I played really well, but for some reason, all of a sudden, I don't know what it was the altitude or something. My Achilles was starting to bother me. They were going to cut me if, if I didn't practice the one day. Wanted to practice, and we won the gold. Matter of fact, I gave that medal to uh, Jim Balvano, and I'm actually just spoke to Pam. If she still has it and doesn't want it, I'd like to get it back. Oh, boy. You want your stuff. No, back. I think it was my grandmother. Grand, yeah. grandmother oh, you want me to rub you? Fortunately, I got a little. The All Star, which I would yeah. trade in a heart. Yeah. Oh, the, the, oh, the, the, oh. The, you want your look at I get my medal, please? That's a like hundred years ago. Well, I wish I could elbow you through the screen. I really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Bring back some of the Beef Brothers. You know, Adam, our, our friendship it goes back to yeah. We both were out there. It wasn't like an AAU where you're playing against somebody every day. This was it was a friendship because. He was a real genuine person, and that's why we're friends till this day, 40-plus years, of just knowing this guy and knowing I got traded. He was more upset when I got traded. He called me to tell me I got traded. I was uh, there, wow. all like, he, he said, those motherfuckers traded you. And I was like, huh? I was sleeping. My, I'm like, I, okay. Detroit. And I said, all right. But our friendship never left. But we also got on the court. And we competed. It was like, yeah, fuck you. We're going at each other. But it was also after the game, let's go get something to eat, have a good time. No question, my friend. Many people are like you. I, I wish you would have, back in the day, got the credit that you deserve as like defensive player of the year. This guy could guard one through five. They talk about it now. It's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. You know, <laughs> he'd guard Mark a guy one night, Dr. J the next, Kareem. Moses, you name it. Thank you, we, sir. We should have won a lot more games. And the teams were a little stacked. You were played for the Celtics, the Lakers, or the Sixers, and they had five or six Hall of Famers. And the two dudes with the shirts. 
<laughs> the referees are also part of that, weren't they? <laughs> Seven against five every night. When we would get on that court, Adam, it was a thing of beauty because it was like we would hit so hard. I'm going to hit them harder than you. Bam. And next thing, I'm going to hit them harder than you. Bam. And it's like, boy, this was fun. It got to the point we were setting picks so hard that they didn't even want to follow the guards sometimes. It made it easier for guards to get layups and, and things like that because their bigs weren't that tough at that time. So they're calling out the screens and then they'd be mad. You should be mad at your teammate for not calling the screens out. It's his fault. Shit. I look forward to delving into your basketball history and talking a lot more about the Washington Bullets and your years in the 1980s together. I believe that the Beef Brothers nickname was actually given to you by Cedric Maxwell during the 1982 playoffs. He might have dubbed you that after one of the playoff games. Does that sound right? Or who actually originated that nickname? We had a couple of nicknames. McNasty and McFilthy. That was the first one, Johnny Most. I'll let Ruland tell you that story with, with well, Johnny first- Most. Brothers, there was a guy with the beef sign in the thing. He had like a, a USDA beef thing, and it said Beef Brothers. That's when I first saw it. But I don't remember. Cedric, I don't know. He's not sharp enough to do Beef Brothers. And I'll talk about my man, Brad. Brad's I, uh, cool. Johnny Moe's story is my mom used to listen like Rick's mom. My mom was on Long Island. She listened to the game on the car radio until I could get her a, a satellite dish. And she's like, you know, I understand the whole Homer thing. She goes, that guy, Johnny Most, I just... A little fucking too much <laughs> with the home in there. Shit. I said, All right, Ma, I got you. So we're warming up, and I see him sitting over there. I did not in his normal seat. I go, Hey, Johnny, I got a message for you. My mother thinks you really suck. <laughs> <laughs> Start the game. Johnny's like, Mrs. Rowland, her name was Swanson, and be at that time. I said, Mrs. Rowland, if you're listening, please turn your radio off. <laughs> Every time we played, it was funny <laughs> as hell. But he was like, oh, my gosh, that's so dirty. God, they, they, nasty. They, they spit him out. They hit him with a baseball bat. That Mahorn, they need to go to jail. <laughs> While you're jumping in the air and stamping on your feet. Yeah. Get up to about 140 degrees and the roaches and the rats are running around there playing cards. <laughs> Not that fucking dead spots on the floor. That place was a shithole. They had three showers. One worked. (laughs) One squirted out little sprinkles of water. Man, Boston, and I know we'll be talking more about it, but when I played with the Pistons, we would come in there because we were getting better. They would do things to try to disrupt you mentally. I guess it was mental warfare. It was like they would break a window when it was like 20 degrees outside, but the shreds of glass were never inside. They were outside. So they were breaking the window inside in order for it to get cold. And we sitting there going like, that's some backwards ass shit. It's so, it's so petty for me. It would fuel me. That's why I never had a bad game in that fucking dump. <laughs> I'm so pissed off about the heat of the showers or the shit treatment. Red, you got you to admire a guy. The fans would call your hotel room hours of the night. You just have to, put, to block it. Do not disturb in your hotel room. Pull oh, fire man. alarms. That fan was just bad. And the people are inviting me home for dinner. The people were great. Boston fans, most of them. Well, I'm white, so <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. Mm, Boston does have a reputation, unfortunately, for better or worse. Just in relation to the arenas, what were some of the favorite places that you enjoyed playing in during your careers? For me, I used to love that teams would boo me and my home team would cheer me. Back then, out of the 22 teams, 21 of them would boo me, and I would love it because if I was on their team, they would be cheering for me. So that was my psychological warfare for them. So the more they booed, the more that encouraged me. They loved me. So my favorite was probably going to Boston because I get a chance to see my family. And what about you, Jeff? First and foremost was the reason I went to Iona was Madison Square Garden. The second was San Antonio. I remember in the old, wherever the hell they played, the Alamo Alamo Dome. It wasn't the Alamo Dome. It was the Hemisphere. Oh, Hemisphere Arena. Yeah. 
Yeah. A lady looked like my mom, and she cussed me out. She called me every fucking name in the book. I just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> okay. It was a fun place. The baseline bum. Yeah, there was a lot. Oh, I looked up, I looked like Anita. I'm like, Anita? She's like, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You got to love fans, because when... Whenever I hear Philadelphia, like they're booing the Joel and Bead and Harden and all them, the fans there, they just want to win. They don't give a damn. They don't give a fuck. Yeah. They, yeah. they want you to put out. They they want you because you're getting paid an absorbent amount of money. If you ain't running in the stands and going after loose balls and doing what you need to do, one thing about Philadelphia fans, I've seen them fight Santa Claus. I don't give a <laughs> hey, no, no, man. I felt so bad because I couldn't play for them when I was hurt. But I was watching my first year there. They beat the shit out of the Redskin guy. They put him in the hospital. They stomped them, man. Hey, I mean, hey. they called it the city of brotherly love. I was like, yeah, they're going to give a brother some love if they come in there with some bullets. I don't think that dude ever recovered. Crazy. But you know what? Fans make this game fun when they act accordingly. You remember when you were in the Boston Garden and guys would say stuff and we just throw the Gatorade or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, my best one, it was this guy at Market Square Arena in Indiana. He'd be under the basket and yelling and making us said, you look like you need some new shoes. You paid all that money for that seat. You need to buy some shoes. His wife was sitting next to him. I said, you kiss your wife with that mouth? And he looked at me, fuck you. And I said, no, nah, just tell your wife. Ah! <laughs> Mad as hell. I said, you just don't know me because I got jokes too. <laughs> if I can ask one thing about some Australian slang, a word or a phrase, any idea what it could mean? I'll tell you right now, I don't know any of it, but I'm willing to learn. Go ahead. How about this one? There's a phrase that we use in Australia that's called budgie smugglers. Do you have any idea what you'd be wearing? Tight pants. You got it, Rick. You got it. Yeah, budgies are... <laughs> Do you have speedos over there, like the male swimming trunks? <laughs> hey, hey, rulers still wear speedos. <laughs> well, there you go. And, and jockey draws. Okay. Thank you. Just quickly, that thank was you very it. much. Yeah, okay, that's it. Mate. Okay, mate. Thank you, you very much, time. mate. Just quickly, we'd love interaction with the show. In future episodes, you can ask Rick or Jeff questions about their careers. We'd love to hear from you. Podcast listeners, send an email in all anus at gmail.com. Just one word in all anus at gmail.com. I can collate the submissions for the future shows. And you can also reach out on Instagram. Rick is Rick Mahorn 44 official. Jeff is Ruland Jeff. Thanks very much for your time today, guys. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to chatting again soon. One more thing, Adam. Sure. Just knock on my door before you leave. Stop lying that you're in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. You're getting ready to do something. He's in else. Brooklyn right now. Get ready to go have a beer. <laughs> He's down the street. All right. See y'all. All right. Thank you, guys. Peace. Bye.